thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we are, wait a minute. All right. Thank you everyone for coming. We are so happy to be here. I'm going to invite those beautiful children if they would like to join us up front because then that will let us see what this legislation is all about. And Gary Faraci, are we fixing this? Okay. All right. All right. Kids front and center. Beautiful. All right. All right, so let's try that again. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am so happy to be here with Governor Lamont and all of our legislative partners to mark this very momentous bill. Gary? All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to use my outside voice. So we are joined today by our champions in the House and in the Senate, uh, Democrats and Republicans who have worked tirelessly for this bill. This legislation will provide $300 million for critical behavioral health investments for our children. It is our hope that these investments in the mental health of our children will offset some of the very severe impacts that COVID-19 has had on our young people and on our families. The help that is available under this legislation includes expanded medical treatment options for children and their families and the ability for families to afford more services for their children and to encourage Connecticut medical practitioners to take on more clients to support our kids and our families. So now we have some amazing advocates who worked so tirelessly for this bill and I am bringing up first our amazing Senator Saud Anwar, Dr. Anwar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Governor. Um, if you've heard that it takes a village, and this is the village. This is the village because it took all of the community. Um, and I'm so proud of our state because um, everybody in our state put our heads together, put our hands together, united to take care of our children. And to the parents and to the children, I just wanted to say that we heard you, we see you, and we love you. And that is why we are here. We have put all of our resources, love, and efforts together. This was uh, an effort where I first wanted to, of, of course, thank the governor for his leadership, making it a priority, and, and the Senate Democrats, uh, uh, Senator Looney, Senator Duff, making this as one of the top priorities for the Senate Democrats. But this was a top priority for all caucuses. This was a top priority for everybody. And, and if you look at the bills, it has ideas from the Senate Democrats, House Democrats, Senate Republicans, House Republicans, and, and of course the governor's bill as well. And that shows that we were in this together for our children. And, and this is heartwarming for me. Um, and um, I just cannot uh, be so proud, more proud of our state for being who we are. And, and uh, this is also a starting point because there's a lot of committees with a lot of recommendations that are going to come. So this is uh, one big step, but not the final step. So I look forward to continuing the work as the co-chair of the Children's Committee and a co-chair of uh, uh, Public Health Committee. And I'm, I'm blessed because I am working with uh, uh, Representative Linehan and also Representative uh, Jonathan Steinberg as well. <laughs> Uh, uh, with the Public Health Committee because uh, uh, they are hardworking individuals who work with their heart and, and I'm blessed to be part of this part, the process. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Senator. So it's my pleasure to introduce someone who was sounding the alarm about the 
dire need of getting more mental health care to our children way before COVID. It's my pleasure to introduce Representative Liz Lenahan. Jonathan and Mary, please come with me. Uh, hi, I'm Representative Liz Lindahan, co-chair of the Children's Committee, and I'd like to thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for those words. That was really kind. And you're right, we have been sounding the alarm. Uh, and Lieutenant Governor was going to use her outdoor voice. I'm always accused of using my outdoor voice, so I think this will go really well. Uh, you know, we are here today to celebrate some legislation that passed bipartisan uh, in both the House and the Senate. Uh, House Bill 5001 was actually uh, unanimous in both chambers. And this is a testament to the need that we have, and we're really, really proud of that. We're proud of the money that we are investing in children's mental health. And uh, the Lieutenant Governor said it well, that we have been sounding the alarm now through the Children's Committee for years. Uh, and so this is just one of the steps that we need to take. I'm really thrilled that we have so many legislators standing with us to do this. Uh, but there is something that I think is really important that I take the time to say today. And that's regarding the shooting in Uvalde. We have been hearing the common refrain over and over again that it's about mental health. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not just about mental health. A child with a mental health issue is not inherently dangerous. They are not inherently violent. So as we sit here and talk about the importance of investing in mental health, we also have to talk about the fact that words matter. And we stand here today to say those with mental health issues, yes, we've heard you. Yes, we're fighting for you. We've been doing this for years and we're gonna to continue to do it because the signing of this bill today, while it's a celebration, it's still a call to action. And that call to action is that, yes, we have invested millions of dollars in our children and in mental health services in schools, but we need the parents to step up and tell their boards of ed, we need you to apply for those grants. We need children who are suffering in silence to know that the adults in their lives agree that they deserve the help, that they're going to get them the help, and that it is okay. And the first step to doing that is by repeating a child with mental illness is not inherently dangerous. I ask if you hear someone say that, if you hear someone say that the tragedy in Texas is about mental health, beg them to finish that sentence. It's about the fact that their governor cut $200 million from the budget for children's mental health. But here in the state of Connecticut, we are investing $500 million more in our children. Yeah. This celebration that's happening today, watching the governor sign this bill is going, I have goosebumps. This is going to be one of the best things that we've done. But make no mistake, we've worked on this for years. We put together legislation through the Children's Committee that addressed bullying in 2019. We not only addressed bullying, but we looked at it through the lens of children, LGBTQ children, who are four times more likely to die by suicide than their peers. We looked at it through, uh, through the racial lens. We've really tried to focus on the reasons why children are bullied that might send them into an area of darkness. And then we talked about uh, making it so that children are getting the services they need because we're asking the right questions. We can't always believe that children, children are able to speak up for themselves, so it's incumbent upon us to ask those questions. The legislation that we put forward in 2020 and the legislation that we're signing now does that by requiring that we screen children for suicidal ideation when they're at the pediatrician. This legislation it allows pediatricians to be trained in how to discuss these issues with kids and parents. This legislation invests so much time and money on keeping our kids safe, happy, and healthy that we are steps beyond other states. And I encourage everyone, 
from the mom in Hamden who reached out to me to say her kid just couldn't get out of bed and go to school. To the grandmother out in the quiet corner who wondered, when is help going to come for her grandchild? To those parents who've been protesting and trying to get help in their towns and asking their boards of ed to stand up and fight for those kids that need it. We are here to say legislators behind me and every single legislator in this state voted for legislation to help you do just that. And so Governor Lamont, thank you, thank you, thank you for signing this legislation today. To all the children out there, we've heard you. We're fighting for you. Help is on the way. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Representative Lenahan. Uh, it is my pleasure to give you yet another fierce advocate and warrior for children's mental health, Representative Tammy Exum. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you so much, Governor. I have to say thank you so much to the speaker because he had such great leadership and commitment around this that allowed us to move forward. And I have to give a shout out to the uh, House Bill 5001 working group. It's a bipartisan working group. We really work together, as you saw and heard, Rep. Linehan, along with Rep. Steinberg, Mary Wielander, along with Kristen mccarty Vahey, Rep. Pettit, and Rep. Nuccio. Um, it was unbelievable working together with them, along with, I have to say, we could not have done this without incredible staff. Uh, I, I, I want to say to Dave DeJarnez and Tim Burgeon and Adam Severa, I see you back there, I just messed up your name, but thank you so much <laughs> for helping to create this legislation that is already being called historic due to its comprehensiveness and its scope. And I want to thank all of my colleagues in both chambers to, to uh, really reinfo reinforce this point. They voted unanimously on this bipartisan legislation. That is huge. the first press conference that we had, I addressed parents who were out there struggling. So I want to say to the mother whose daughter was off the chart for depression, but she couldn't find a psychiatrist, please know that we heard you. To the parents of the child that had to seek care in another state, especially during the height of the COVID pandemic crisis, we heard you. To the superintendent who told me that his top need for his school district was beds to adequately treat kids before they returned to school as they were unable to learn, we heard you. To the children sleeping in the hospital hallways due to inadequate preventative services, an influx of cases, and a lack of proper placement options, we heard you. To the teachers who are already overwhelmed by the mounting responsibilities and yet are so worried about the mental health needs of their students, we heard you. To the psychologists whose staff dreads telling another parent that the wait time for their loved one is one year, we heard you. To the mother whose child was unable to get recommended services, the intensive in-home uh, therapy like ICAPS because she had commercial insurance and not Husky. We heard you. To the community filled with traumatized youth who need programs and services specifically to address that trauma, we heard you too. We've heard so many of you and we thank you for sharing your cares and your concerns, your frustrations and your lived experiences. That feedback, coupled with a 16-hour hearing and scores of me on Zoom <laughs> and scores of meetings from November to April with those most impacted, educators, providers, children, parents, advocates, the agencies whose input helped to create HB 5001, a comprehensive, integrated framework for the delivery of children's mental health services and care for all children in the state of Connecticut. Coupled with the governor's bill, Senate bills one and two, we have created 
benchmark legislation that is already being recognized by other states. And I am proud to see Connecticut as a national leader. And I'm proud and pleased of this bipartisan work that enabled us to craft such a strong piece of legislation. Still, this is just the beginning and is certainly not the end. We must be sure that we implement what is in this bill and that we recognize that this work will continue to need fine tuning. We need to review data outcomes, look at utilization, communicate with providers, schools, hospitals, community-based organizations to be sure that we are closing the gaps, increasing access in providers, truly addressing needs. The children and the families of Connecticut, you deserve no less. But today, today is a good day. Today is a great day as we continue to update and build upon past and current work while creating an effective structure for tomorrow. This benchmark legislation comes at a critical time. It addresses the urgency of now. It invests in the well-being of our children now and will improve and literally save lives now. Thank you so much for being here today. And now uh, someone who teaches kids in addition to legislating, State Senator Doug McCrory. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, thanks for you all coming out and listening to this press conference. Very important. Thank the governor for his leadership, um, for this piece of legislation. I thank all my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Uh, for putting forth a piece of legislation that, that is historic in the state of Connecticut. I think I listened to one of my colleagues say that a child with mental health issue is a child that's actually in need, that needs support and help. I've been educated for 31 years and chaired this committee for the last three. And my conversations with my colleagues in education is conversations I've never heard before. The concerns that our children are having in our schools the supports that they need from us, we listen and we're going to deliver. We spend $100 million on early childhood education, unheard of, unprecedented, because we know our children need a better start before they come into the schools. We spend close to $100 million for social emotional supports, for the investment in our children. This is home to me this year because in, in our city, we had two 13-year-old children take their lives. Never heard of that before. Two 13-year-old children, one because of opioids, and the other one just felt as though they didn't have someone else to talk to. Didn't have a person to concern that felt as though they heard their concerns. 13 years old, and they gave up on their life. We cannot have that as a society. If that's where we are, we failed. We are on the bottom floor. But with this piece of legislation, we have, we're going to put the supports in place to help our children, to help our families, to help our parents, to build our neighborhoods, to build our communities, one person at a time. I want to thank, again, everyone who came out here to understand the importance and the time that we're in. Our children, our families are suffering from PTSD. We're in a very unusual climate in this country. And people are worried and concerned. They're concerned about themselves, their children, their family, and the future of this country. And if we don't get it together beyond mental health, but how we treat each other, how we work with each other, how we support each other, then we're going to be in a long, 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 long cause. We got work to do. And again, thank you for Connecticut for listening to the concerns of parents and children who don't have a voice like we do. But I think all my colleagues from both sides of the aisle understood that. And it was the easiest piece of legislation I ever passed with this amount of money. Exactly. This amount of money. Never seen this before. But it's a good thing we got it done. Thank you again.
it's my pleasure to introduce Senator Martin Looney, who made this piece of legislation a top priority for his caucus. Senator Looney. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Lieutenant Governor. As you, as you might uh, tell uh, by the numbers, Senate Bill 1 and Senate Bill 2 uh, were the major priorities for our, our caucus uh, in this session. I wanted to, uh, to thank uh, on, the, on the Senate side, obviously, the great leadership of Senator McCrory, Senate Bill 1 that came through the Education Committee, uh, and Senator Anwar uh, uh, for Senate Bill 2 that came to the uh, Children's Committee, uh, their counterparts in the, in the House as well. Uh, I want to thank Speaker Ritter and, uh, and also uh, <coughs> the Majority Leader, uh, Representative Rojas as well, our Majority Leader, Senator Duff, who uh, had the sense of urgency about this process from the beginning, as, uh, as we all did. I uh, want to thank the Governor for his support of Senate Bill 1, Senate Bill 2, and also of, uh, of House Bill 5001, which in itself, which is certainly a companion uh, to the other two. And what we need to recognize is that there was already a problem with children's mental health and inadequate of services and gaps in service provision uh, prior to the pandemic. But that became even worse starting in 2020. I think each legislator here has received anguished calls from constituents. Uh, what can I do? My child is clearly ill. Uh, I can't get an uh, adequate continuity of services. There are, there are some services provided through the schools, uh, but I need more than what's provided through the schools. And I can't get access uh, to private treatment. I can't find a, a child psychiatrist who's, uh, uh, who's willing to take my child on as a patient. Uh, they don't take insurance. What can we do? We're struggling. We're desperate. We are hearing that all the time. And these three bills uh, will address that. We have heard what the people of Connecticut have asked for and are addressing that in these three bills. And I want to thank the governor so much for, uh, for his uh, energy on this, the lieutenant governor for her advocacy. Um, and uh, again, this is a problem that has been in our midst uh, for years, but it has gotten to a point of such urgency uh, because of the uh, exacerbating effect of the last two years of the pandemic uh, that more families are struggling, more families are desperate, and more families are fearful about what this might mean for their children. Uh, and this is our response. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator. And our final speaker before we sign the bill, our great governor, Ned Lamont. Susan, I think we've signed a few bills in our day, and this is most important in terms of, A, the number of people who are here. Um, Doug mentioned the dollar amount, but I think more importantly, just the impact it has. And uh, first of all, I want to thank all the legislators on both sides of the aisle for everything you did in making this prominent. And uh, somebody didn't get mentioned, but Kevin Kelly over there, what this meant in terms of uh, a bipartisan showing that we can, make, we can work on behalf of people. Thank you. Liz or Sal mentioned the alarm bells going off. And we all heard those alarm bells in different ways. Um, you know, I heard it from teachers. I heard it from the parents. I heard it from the parents. You all talked about the phone calls that you were getting. I heard about the phone calls because I watched CTN and I was watching your heartfelt. I also heard it from the kids. You know, there's a lot of worry about stigma. And I was there at Enfield High School and talk about if you had $10,000 to invest, what would you want to invest in? What would be something that would make the biggest difference in your life? Something fun? Go oh, Disney World? And they said unanimously, mental health. Mental health. Uh, a confidential counselor, a shoulder I can lean upon. And these are 17-year-old boys. <laughs> and uh, that really resonated with me. And if one other thing that I certainly have learned over the last two or three years is it's not simply build it and they will come. We have to come out and reach out to you. And uh, that's what we've got to do a better job. I mean, that's where we're adding the number of social workers we got in the schools right now. It's just down at Thurman Milner School that said things are getting better for most of our kids, but by no means for all of our kids. We need a little extra help. That's what I love about this uh, bill that says, look, we're going to add on 36 more districts where we're going to have school-based health clinics starting with mental health right there, making easy access for you.
Ed. For those of you at home, you're distressed, you've got a kid in real need, and you, you dial 911, you know, they, they send a cop. Well, we're sending now a special mental health van with the right people you need coming to your home right there for you. Make sure you have the need and support that you deserve. So, it's not every day we do important things. I think today, together, we're doing something incredibly important, and I'm so proud that Connecticut is a leader where it really makes a difference. And that's to each and every one of you. Thanks. Stay right here. We'll take on topic questions about the legislation. <laughs> Going once? How, how soon will this money start to go out? So the question was how soon is the money coming? Who would like to take that? I know there's some you have to apply for. So, may I? Yes, please. So there are a few parts uh, of this that um, are effective upon passage and there are a few things that uh, need to start uh, a year from now. However, the very first thing that I'm proud to say is going to happen is that the um, IOP program through Wheeler Clinic in Waterbury will be opening uh, late summer, early fall, serving as much as four, 144 kids per year in an intensive outpatient treatment. That is an immediate need, and we have answered that call immediately. I think the, the bills have a number of different grants, and then those grants should be available soon as well. And then uh, there are committees and then different groups that are going to be created that would be giving more recommendations for future. But with respect to the money, we'll start to see some within the next month and then in the beginning of the next year. Has uh, Connecticut adequately uh, funded uh, children's mental health, adolescent mental health, uh, since Sandy Hook? There was. Uh, uh, that was one of the big components of the state response, um, and it looks like about, I don't know, where we spend about $75 million a year on uh, youth services grants and another 60 70 on uh, mental health services grants. Okay, uh, go ahead. So uh, I can repeat the question for yeah. everybody. Uh, the, the question is about uh, whether the state has put enough resources uh, post Sandy Hook. Um, I can tell you post Sandy Hook, um, there were committees and groups that were created, and I have had the chance to listen into the, the capacity of the group, some of the most committed individuals with uh, a very deep understanding of what the needs are, um, have given recommendations. 
Uh, those recommendations have not always been followed, and I'm talking about uh, in the last uh, many years. Um, and that's part of the reason where we are. And, and, and the information that we have gathered from some of those resources and those conversations have helped us formulate these bills as well. Mm -hmm. Why were those recommendations followed? Uh, resource allocation limitations. Money. It's money. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what? Um, it, it is resource allocation. I think that that's a big part of it. But we also have to remember that sometimes these things, uh, uh, you know, they grow and they change. So the recommendations that have been coming out year after year, um, some of them uh, are a little obsolete at this point. So I think that it's it's important to note that. Uh, we can implement some of them and we can't others because of funding, but it's not like we could come back the next budget cycle and implement those things that we talked about four or six years ago because those things uh, we need to continue to grow and change and that's why these bills were written in the way they were because they're what we, is needed now and in the future. Governor, are you satisfied with the level of uh, support now for uh, children's mental health, adolescent mental health? I don't know, Paul. But I know that uh, this $100 million investment um, is going to make a difference. I don't know whether we did enough after Sandy Hook, but we tried. Obviously, we thought we had to do more, especially coming after two and a half years of COVID. And um, we're going to make a difference in these kids' lives. And uh, if we have to do more, we'll do more. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Representative Tammy Nuccio, and uh, I'm in the minority party, and I worked on this bill a lot, and I would like to say, the, in regards to the funding, one very important thing to note here is that we took advantage of an opportunity that was presented to the state that had not been here in the past. This is money that came to us from federal ARPA funding, and knowing that COVID-19 really exasperated the mental health issues that we were seeing in children, this is something that we can say we absolutely use this money for its 100% intended use, which is to rebound from COVID. So having this money available in, in 5001, at least 90 plus percent of that bill is funded by ARPA money with, um, with data collection on the back end. So then we can look at the information that we're getting to see if whether or not what we have put out there is actually going to work. And if it doesn't, we have the opportunity to tweak it. And if it does, then we have the conversation of how we put it forward in the budget. But using the ARPA money for this programming was paramount in us being able to get these resources out to the children. And more importantly, we also did workforce development and changes in our insurance legislation for mental health uh, preventative visits. This is a very broad scope bill and the majority of the funding is through ARPA. So that is a, a thing that we should really focus on here as an opportunity that the state had that we did not have in the past. on this topic. All right, thank you all so much for coming. We appreciate it. Right, don't, don't leave, I want to take a selfie. <laughs> 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 <laughs>